Oh, look at this. <laughs> what are you wiping the windows? <laughs> yeah. Oh, look at that. That's nice and shiny. Well, it's a 78. Yeah, it's looking good. It looks really good. Yeah, it's got original paint, too. And yeah. People that owned this thing before me must have put the thing away in its Long Island, New York garage every day of its life. Oh, go figure. Look at this. Oh, look for, at this. Got it for 700 bucks. It's real clean. It can work on it. It's whatever. The things are not packed real close Right, 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 right. There's still a lot of room to work <laughs> So with yeah. that consideration, right. you know, I'll go. That, You'll uh, still do it. Part that seven. Part that. <laughs> look at this. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Look at this. <laughs> you know, when I see a car like this, first thing I do is I say, "Would you look at this?" You know what I mean? Yeah. Sure. Oh, would you look at this? <laughs> yeah, well. Would you look at that? Yeah, there's a few more blemishes on the car. The oh, car, my gosh. Just car, look at the it. The car is not perfect. Just look <laughs> at it. Just look at it. Oh, look at this. You got me running all around the car. <laughs> yeah, the only Oh, would car. you it's look at that? Put that just on. look at that. I can't pull it out either. I'd have to drill it. Why don't you just look at it? Yeah, it's sad. It's the only mark I on mean, the just car. look at it. Yeah. I mean, just get a look at that. A cop did that. A cop. Oh, where is he? I'd like to look at him. Yeah, went, over, went over and tried to fight it. Yeah. They told me we're not required to post warnings here in New Jersey. Oh, would you look at that. There Listen, I got pulled state. over in Jersey twice for not wearing a seatbelt in the passenger oh, seat. Yeah. In the passenger oh, seat. Really? And got a $40 oh, ticket. Yeah, I right. said, well, would see, you look at that? The way they got would no you look at that? Would you look at it? I was so mad. Basically, they got to earn their money the old-fashioned yeah. way. Whenever a cop writes you out a ticket, the first thing you do is you take the ticket and you say, would you look at this? You know what I mean? Yeah, well, if I'd have done that, the cop did it and I wasn't there that night. Yeah, um, you should have said, look at this, and that would have probably got you off if you told them to look well, at it. Well, the thing. Yeah. I went over there yeah, the first this, time yo, to look fight at this. it. Yeah, you got to look at it. Yeah, look at this. Yeah, right, right, because he had to look at it first. He didn't show up Yeah, because he had to look time. at it, because you know he had to look at this. You know what the judge did? He probably had to look at it and say, look at this. And I asked him the yeah. second time I went and then he, yeah. See, I figured I was just going to get off. And then he said, look at it, right. And he said, look at this. And I asked the cop, where were you the Last time he said, last time he said look at this. Got, my guess is <laughs> he I, probably did that. Oh, would you look at this? Oh, would you look at that? Oh, look at that. What an idiot. Would you look at this? Oh, look at that. Look at that. Look at this. I'd have to I'd have to drill it out. I've tried getting under here. <laughs> oh, would you look at that? You <laughs> got under? Wheel, yeah, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, look at this. Look at that. Yeah, look see, at this. And if you tell that to the cops, that. they're not going to give you any consideration. Oh, look at that. I, you got to look at it this way, okay? You just got to look at it. That's all you can do anymore. Yeah, I looked at it as right, and I, uh, I see, you know. <laughs> he finally looked at it. He finally looked at it after all that begging. The older guy finally looked at it. Today we're beginning a new series, a new sermon series, but I, which I believe is going to challenge us of the next few weeks and it is my prayer that through this series uh, that we're going to experience and witness spiritual growth in our lives and in the lives of those people sitting beside us like maybe we've never seen before I am expecting this series to do great things in your life but not only in your life in the life of this church this is going to be a series that is going to be challenging at times I'm not going to expect you to be happy with me all the time. I'm okay with that. As long as I'm preaching God's word. But I believe if we listen to what God is going to speak to us over the next few weeks, he will push us to live a life of holiness. Being holy because he is holy, as the Bible tells us. That is instruction from God, not from just your pastor. Holy, righteous, living, living is critical. And in order to live a holy life, we need to have an understanding of what that looks like. And we have to be willing to examine ourselves. We have to look inside ourselves and make sure our lives are pleasing to God. Romans chapter 12 says it this way in a popular scripture. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... To offer your bodies as living, a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, 
and perfect will. So here's some questions for you. Is there anything in your life this morning that is not pleasing to God? Is there anything in your life this morning that is not pleasing to God? Anything that is hindering your spiritual walk and growth? This is the questions you have to answer for yourself. I have to answer them for me. You have to answer them for you. Is God trying to draw your attention to something in your life that you need to address by asking, would you look at that? Is God just trying to get you to say, yeah, yeah, I'm looking at it. Is there something in your life? I've already got your wheels turning. I get it. I'm going in heavy early. Is there something in your life that you just need to look at? And God's saying, would you look at that? Titus chapter 2. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Verse 6, similarly, Encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. To live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to, to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. May God add his blessing to his word this morning. I hope you don't see me as being as much a rebuker this morning as an encourager, as Paul's words point out here. In the opening video, the younger guy was trying to comically get the older guy to look at it. Would you just look at that? Just look at it. Just look at it. Can you believe this? Just look at this. He was trying to draw his attention to the smallest, most insignificant things on the car that probably weren't even there, as we saw him pointing out on the hood. He was trying to just get him to focus his attention on something other than what he desired to. And in today's culture, the task of getting someone to look at something or to be distracted from what they're supposed to be focusing on is not normally a difficult challenge. With our fast-paced society and culture that's constant, constantly changing, our focus is always shifting from one thing to another. I don't believe anybody can disagree with that. Our focus is, have you ever had a day where you just felt like you couldn't focus on one thing? It's kind of every day, right? The world is throwing so much at us that it's easy to lose focus. And somebody just says, would you look at that? Focus turned. Would you look at that? Would you look at that ugly Tennessee orange? 
Would you look at that? Would you look at that spiked hair on that pastor? Would you look at the picture that she put on Facebook? Can you believe that? What is she doing here? Look at that woman. Why is she here? Why did that guy post that comment on social media? Would you look at that? Can you believe he said that? How dare she put that picture up? I mean, he's supposed to be a Christian. She's always bragging about going to that church down there by the lake behind Walmart. How great her pastor is. Can you believe, does, is he not preaching better than that? Would you look at that? Can you believe they're doing that? They, want, they invite me to church and yet this is how they live? That's no different than how I'm living now. Why should I go to church when they're going to ask for my money? As Christians, as true Christians, we should be quite a contrast from what the world looks like. We're to be anchored in Christ, immovable, steadfast, and strong. And our eyes are to be fixed on the word of God. As 2 Peter says, shining like a lamp in a dark place. And as we move toward that light of God's word, he changes our life by the power of the Holy Spirit and illuminates us and makes us shine in that dark place. He makes us the light in the dark place by the power of his Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. Holy Righteous living is the backbone of the gospel that we stand for and preach. I didn't expect any amens. Holy, righteous living in the sight of God is the backbone of the gospel that we preach. And Paul understood that. As he talks to Titus here, as he writes to Titus and says, Go and share this with the people of Crete. Share this information with the people of Crete. This pagan culture who does everything they can to persecute Christians and discredit the Christian faith that we stand for. This is our opponent. This is our opposition. They don't like us, Titus. So here's what I want you to go go do. I want you to go tell them that they needed to, to deny the ungodly and worldly desires that they are pursuing. I bet Titus didn't really, wasn't really excited about going and sharing this message. I'm not really excited about sharing this message this morning. And I'm sitting among people that love me, I believe. So how did Titus feel about going and sharing this with people who persecuted the faith that he stood for? Looking at them in the face and saying, you've got to turn from your ungodly ways. You can't live the way that you're living. God's called us to live holy, righteous lives. And there's benefit to that for us. We draw closer to him. He brings about joy and peace in our lives because we are drawing, living a holy life acceptable in his sight. We hope to one day earn that gift of living eternally with him. There's benefit to it. But I'm going to argue this morning That the benefit is not as much for us as it is for others. The benefit of us living holy, acceptable lives is not as much for us as it is for others. Because sometimes we just get content with the relationship that we have with God. I'm good. I know I'm saved. I'm dealing with this stuff that I'm trying to work through. But God's grace covers that. His love is bigger than that, so I'm I'm just going to tiptoe through it. Sometimes we get that way. I'm just okay with the the relationship I have with the Lord. I'm just okay with that. You see, the thing is, I can half-heartedly give into the relationship with my wife and do my part. And yes, 
that limits the benefits that I reap from my relationship. But it's affecting more than just me. It's affecting her. If I don't give my all and I don't live as a godly husband that God's called me to be, I'm not just affecting myself, I'm affecting her and eventually my children and everybody else that encounters our family. So if you are not living a holy, righteous life and you're not looking at the things that God desires for you to look at that you've been dealing with in your heart, you're affecting more than just yourself, honey. I'm sorry to tell you, you're affecting everybody that's around you. And you're affecting the gospel that you're supposed to represent. Let me tell you something. In these instructions to Titus, in Titus chapter 2, Paul sets forth evangelism as the motive for holy living. This is what you must do, and this is why you must do it. For Paul, holy living is the best tool available to Christians to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of his grace and love. You just read the same chapter I did. He tells them these things. You need to live holy, godly lifestyles so that when those people who persecute you come against you, you can embarrass them because they have nothing to throw in your face. How many times do people persecute you because of your faith? If they don't, then you're not living your faith out like you should. If you're not getting persecuted from those in the community around you that maybe you work with or you connect with, then maybe it's because you're playing on the same team. This is not easy to preach, folks. But when's the last time you've been persecuted for your faith? Is it because you might look like the world that you live in? Or are you living a godly, holy life? Acceptable in the eyes of God. The credibility of the Christian gospel is linked to the integrity of the lives of those who proclaim it. The gospel depends on the life that you live. Think about that a moment. Christ came and did his work and he left. And then he called us through the great commission to go and continue to do his work. So sharing his gospel and carrying that forward depends on the life that you live today. Think about that. That is a huge responsibility. And that is why it's important for you to choose to live a holy, upright life in the sight of God. What's on the line if we fail to live a holy life as God has instructed us to do? What is on the line if we fail to live out the life that God has instructed us to do? Here's a simple answer. The ability to reach others for Christ. If Paul says that the greatest motive for living a holy life is for the benefit of sharing the gospel to others, then the life that we live dictates whether or not we're going to be successful in reaching people with the glory and, or the gospel of Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. When's the last time you led someone to know the Lord as, his, as your, their Lord and Savior? When's the last time you witnessed to somebody and evangelized to somebody and asked them if they knew Jesus? When's the last time someone got saved in this church? We're the church of the Almighty God who accepted the Great Commission to go and preach and make disciples, sharing the Word of God from here to there. From one side of the world to the other. That's who we are. Are we the church? When's the last time somebody ran to our altars, crying on their face before God, and said, Father, forgive me of my sins. Christ came to redeem me, and I want him to save me today. If people are not coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior in our church, our church is not living out the holy commandment that God has called us to do. 
I don't care how much money we give away. I don't care how much paint we put on the walls. I don't care how great our music is. I don't care what the sermon series is. I don't care what, I mean, how big the slip and slide is for the splash bash. This is about seeing people come to know Jesus. And if we're not seeing it, we have to look in ourselves and examine ourselves as individuals and as a group to say, God, are we living holy, acceptable, righteous lives in your sight? Are we doing it? Is the life that we're living convincing enough? Let me tell you something. I could come in here and present you with a five or seven step process to proper evangelism in the dying, and dying community. And we could walk through that seven step process. Well, this is how we're going to reach the people for Jesus. Step one. That's a bunch of baloney if we're not living holy, righteous lives. Because we're going to be the ones that convinces somebody else to come to know him. Most of you probably, most likely, came to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior because somebody else in your life was a great example of what that faith looks like. My parents was that for me. I watched my mom and my dad live holy, righteous lives, and they continue to do that today. And because of that, I wanted. They convinced me enough that this is something I've got to have. Jesus didn't come down and speak to me and say, Hey, young man, remember I died for you on that cross. Me and you should be buddies. I'm not trying to be overly funny here. I'm just saying... The people in your life that were closest to you when you came to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior are the ones that helped convince you to take that road. I'm totally convinced of it. Or maybe it was the church that you were raised in that did it. Let me tell you something. Making salvation attractive to others is a high calling. And we fail in that endeavor unless we can demonstrate that we have indeed been delivered from sin, worldliness, and ungodliness. If we are still living in the sin and the ungodliness and the worldliness that we had and lived in when we were sinners, then what? how convincing are we at selling this salvation thing? To convince a person that Jesus can save, I need to show them a man that has been saved. For me to convince a person that God can give hope, I need to show them a man with hope. To convince a person that God can give peace and joy and love and complete total satisfaction, I need to show the world somebody who is satisfied, who is walking in the love, joy, and peace of Christ. And if we expect to bring people in here and for God to bring people to us that need him as their savior, then when they get here, we've got to be able to convince them that we are a people that love God, walk in his commandments, and live godly, holy, righteous lives in his sight. Willing to examine ourselves from the inside out to say, God, show me what I need to look at today. Show me what is there that I need to get rid of. Because if that thing is keeping my brother or my sister or my mom or my dad or my son or my daughter or my neighbor or my coworker or my father or my mother from coming to know you as their savior, I want to get rid of it. And I want to overcome it by the power of the blood of Jesus in my life. This is important, folks. If you're dealing with depression and addiction and you're dealing with anger and emotional distress and you've got sin and ungodliness in your life that you have not overcome, get over it. Because people need to know Jesus. People need to know the gospel of the Jesus Christ that we serve and love. And your life and the life you live dictates whether or not 
they might accept him. It dictates it. You can come on up. Nick, if you don't mind. I've not preached half my sermon this morning. I probably got four pages, and I might have preached one and a half. But the message is simple. The message is simple this morning, folks. It is simple. We've got to look inside ourselves individually, as families, as couples, and as a body. And we've got to go to the Lord in prayer starting today and say, God, show me what I need to look at. Some of you already know things. You're, God's convicting you right now of things you need to deal with. I know it because I've been pre prepping for this summer for a long time, and he's been working on me. From the time I started, the Holy Spirit of God has been working on me. Well, you're the pastor. Surely you live an upright life. Sure. I try my best. But I'm human. I deal with things too. But let me tell you something. I'm not going to pastor a church that's not going to see people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I'll walk out the front door. I know that's a bold statement. But our district superintendent has challenged us and even told us. As he asked the question, why do we have churches in our district who haven't seen anybody saved in five years? You've got all zeros in your reporting of, people, of salvations. What is your purpose? To come together and kumbaya and eat, eat a meal every now and then? Make each other feel good? That's basically the challenge he gave. It's not about us. I hope you walk out of here feeling strong and good this morning and encouraged in your spirit. But in doing so, get out there and try to win the lost for Jesus. Sister Vivian, that's what it's about. Because what if somebody had not cared about you and your salvation? What if, what if you had not been reached? What if you were that person? There's a world out there that needs us. Needs this church. Needs you and you and you and you and you and you. All of you. He, they need us all. you don't believe it just look around do you look any different from them are you a light in a dark world everybody standing if you would can people look at you and tell that there's something different has anybody ever just walked up to you and be like there's something different about you We ran into a guy at a ball game this week. I didn't know him from Adam. We stood around and talked for about 15 minutes in line and all this kind of stuff. And we just got to talking. And he said he used to live in Fort Oglethorpe and this kind of stuff. And then he looks at me and says, what church do you go to? I'm like, how do you know I go to church? He could tell. I said, well, actually... I told him what I did. He sensed it. That's what I want. I want my light to shine, Joey. I want people to look at me without even saying a word and be like, there's something different about this guy. I see godliness. I see holiness. I see righteousness. I see love and grace and purity in his life. Is the world saying that about you or you just look like the world? Do you just look like the world? Have you done anything to set yourself apart from those that God has called you to? And my last question 
Is your life convincing enough to get others to follow the God that you serve? Father, we thank you, God, for this service today. God, I preached your word like you gave it to me. It's not fun. It's not easy. I'm not even really proud of it, God, but I hope you are, and I hope that you find favor on the words that have been spoken today. God, let it penetrate our hearts, God, starting with mine, dear Lord. Let everything that's been said today, dear God, move us. Let it move us, God, to make a decision, God to examine ourselves, to look inside ourselves. What is it that you would have us to look at, Father? What is it in our lives? How can we overcome it? How can we deal with it? Because it matters. It matters not just to us and our relationship with you, but it matters so importantly to how we can evangelize and reach those that are around us. Be in a light in a dark place. God, help our light to shine, God. Help our lives, God, the, the, the Christian lives that we live, be holy because you are holy. And let us live an upright life in your sight so that our lives will be convincing to those around us that don't know you let it be convincing to them, God, that they want to know what this Jesus, who this Jesus is that we serve. Make it convincing that they might ask, what is it about you? Tell me about this place you go to every Sunday. Tell me about this Jesus you cry out to all the time. Tell me about this person that made this significant change in your life. God, may our lives be convincing to others from this point forward. And starting right now, God, may you speak to us and start showing us things in our lives that we need to overcome, barriers, hindrances that we need to face and deal with and call them out for what they are. May we finally look at it. Be with us as we go from this place, God. Use us in a mighty way this week to be your people and fulfill your great commission. We love you. We thank you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. I'm just going to go and warn you. I'm going to warn you. This was just the foundation of what we're about to dive into. Next week, we're going to start calling out specific things that we deal with in our lives and how we can overcome them. I know this is not easy, but this is what spiritual growth looks like. Getting the weeds out of your life so that you can flourish and grow into what God has called you to be. Here's a proposal for you. I'm your pastor. I love you all. I'm here for you. If you need to talk about something that you're dealing with or you need help with it, I'm here. I'll do anything I can to grab your hand and walk this path with you. Don't try to go it alone. If I'm not that person, find somebody. Find a brother or sister here that can walk that with you. And hold you accountable. Live a holy and righteous life in the sight of God. Your life and the lives of others depends on it. I love you. Jesus loves you. I hope you have a wonderful week. Don't forget Wednesday night Bible study at 7 o'clock.